So you all have a book on your table, and it looks quite simple. We've tried to make it very simple, but it's data of each and every one of our clients. And for those that have been in the sector, and I know a couple of you here, um, that is challenging. Um, so I'll quickly walk through this book. Uh, the data at the group level, uh, the information of each MFI is in the book itself as well. And I'll try to make it um, as fun as possible. <laughs> I hope it will. So the book is structured into three sections. Oh, sorry. So the book is structured in three sections, and we're trying to address three main questions. The first question is, who are we targeting? Are we really targeting poor people? That's the first question we had, and that's how we start. The second question we had is, how are they developing over time? And we're talking about their businesses here. So that's what we're going to look at. And the third question is, how are we supporting them in their progress? If we are at all. <laughs> so we'll quickly start with the first point on how we target our clients. Rodrigo already explained, we segment them through four categories, extremely poor, poor, vulnerable, and other. The first graph on your right, you have the total portfolio and the new clients we acquire. And you can see that we reach, in total, 83% of our clients are vulnerable. That is, they're either, they're three times below the poverty line. We've done that consistently since 2011. The, poverty li the vulnerability line that we have since 2011, it's 90% and it's been kept above 85%, and we targeted 87% vulnerable clients in 2015. We're also able to look at vulnerability dimensions. We've defined four here. Gender, environment, age, and education. You can see that these do not change too much over time. Si over around 60% of our clients are women, and almost 50% have a very low education that is primary at best, so either primary or below. This, although it seems straightforward and a lot of MFIs do it, this is crucial because when we've been in talks with a lot of networks and a lot of MFIs, unless you know what your sample client base looks like, you don't know how to have the next discussion. We need to be able to compare apples to apples. We need to be able to, sure, to ensure that we know what we're measuring, who we're measuring. So this is quite important. We've had a little snapshot on gender. This is not in the report, so for the benefit of making the effort of coming here. Um, you have on your left side the new credit clients. It's the same graph as we saw before, and we distribute it between men and women. The lower part are men, the upper part are women. And you can see that in terms of vulnerability, we always target more vulnerable women, 90% in 2015, and 82% are men in 2015. How does that translate into your vulnerability segments? That's the graph on the right. When we classify them as extremely poor, poor, vulnerable, or other, the majority of women stand in extremely poor and poor segments. So this is the result of why most of our clients are vulnerable. Indeed, when we look at how we target the new clients every year, we look at their sales and loan disbursements. You'll see that the level of sales and the level of loan disbursement of women is significantly lower than for men. In terms of sales, it's 33% 33 lower, and in terms of loan disbursement, it's 63% lower. Going to their enterprises, what, what are we talking about? We all think and know we're talking about small vendors, but in reality, do we know exactly what amount it is? What percentage it represents? 57% are trade. This classification is based on the United States classification of sector. We can go deeper. We've kept it high level. We've distributed by urban and rural areas. Of course, in rural areas, there's more clients in agriculture, 37%. And in urban areas, it's 60%. And these enterprises, we're talking again about small enterprises. So 85% of our clients do not have employees. 15% hire one or more employees. Across vulnerability segments, of course, when you're poor, 10% hire one or more employees. When they're less poor, what we call other, um, it's actually 27%. So still small enterprises. So now we've characterized our clients. How are they progressing over time? 
for us, what was important to look at is, sorry, their, their enterprises themselves. So we're able to gather information about their balance sheet, their P&L, and then we've tracked that over time. We've been able to do that in a, with reliable information since 2011. Let me start by assets. I'm, look, I'm gonna think here, change, <laughs> switch your mindset and think about cohorts, vintage. Number of clients that enter in a specific year. We start with 2011. Level of average assets that they have, that year, that average number of clients that we, we, that we served was about $3,000. We look at them in December 2015. Their level is $7,000. How much growth do they have yearly? About 27%. And we're looking at 33,000 clients. Those are the clients that still remain for, with us and that have entered in 2011. And we can look at that over time. On average, what does that mean? That means that each cohort, when we have done the compound weight <laughs> annual growth, uh, is 30% in terms of average as assets. So we can confirm with real data from each and, one of our, each and every one of our clients, they're consistently growing. We've done it as well for sales and for net income. And both sales and net income grow roughly at 16% yearly. When we looked at it over time, here again, we confirmed that the longer a client remains with us, the higher their sales grow. So there seems to be a certain correlation between their relationship with us and growth, and hopefully coming out of poverty. So that's when we looked at the client segmentation. We looked at their net income, as Rodrigo explained, net income per person in their household, so per capita. And we looked again at it by segments. Here we have the classification again, of vulnerability levels by cohort. In this case, 55% in the, when they enter, 55% of their clients are poor, either poor, classified as poor, or extremely poor. What happens a year later? It's only 27%. What happens for each cohort? Again, we see a decrease of our poor clients across time. Of course, in 2014, it only goes from 51% um, to 40%. It's a, a little less because they've spent less time with us. But consistently over time, we're able to say that their net income grows. It grows with us. We grow with them together over time. Look, looking at this differently and focusing only on the poor, we can see that for 2011, 51% of our clients that joined in 2011, as of December 15, are no longer classified as poor. We've done this for the last four cohorts, and we can say that on average in two years, 32% of our clients are able to <coughs> not be classified as poor anymore. So they overcome a certain way the poverty line. We've looked at it also lo going a little bit further, looking beyond the numbers, uh, and we've looked at three dimensions mainly, job creation, health, and, uh, health and housing. In terms of job creation, although few of them employ other people, we can say that they've created additional jobs. When we've tracked it over time, we realized that uh, roughly 11% of our clients create additional jobs in four years. How does that translate in absolute numbers? 120,000 jobs were created in the last four years with the clients that remain with us. Housing. We're able to address per client how they've improved their housing conditions. What does that mean? They have another, another room. They own the house instead of renting it. They have better fuel conditions. And we've, we have a sort of check. You know, If you improve your housing conditions, you get a one. 5% of our clients have improved their housing conditions in the last four years. We've looked at one specific example. Take Banca Mia, for example. This is our largest institution in Colombia. And we've been able to see that 4.8% 4, 4 of our clients have improved their housing conditions. That's roughly 7,000 clients. 3.6 improve in sanitary conditions that have, they have septic waters. Uh, 1.8 improve the number of rooms. 1.6 have better construction materials. And 0.4 have improvement in fuel conditions. That's the level of detail that we have. We show aggregate data, but we go very deep. In terms of healthcare, same thing. In this case, we only look at two entities. Banco de Pem is the main driver of the data here. 
24% of clients with Banco Adepem have improved their health conditions. How do you measure it? Looking at the insurance, the health, health insurance that they have. For just, let's take one cohort only. For 2011, 24% of the clients that joined in 2011, as of December 15, 24% have improved their health conditions. That is, they had no insurance, and now they have an insurance of some sort. Private, public, mixed, whatever they have. They've improved. Not only have they improved, but at the beginning, just to have an idea of the basis of clients we're talking about, 60% had no insurance at all. So having a 24% improvement is significant. For the total portfolio, 12% have improved, of which 5,560 clients in terms of absolute numbers. How do we support their growth? How are we helping them grow? That's quite difficult to assess, but we've started to, do it, to look at it in various, various ways. The first one is in terms of the loans we give out. We've seen that the loan installment that we give represents roughly 9% of their total sales. We started with a huge challenge, with a huge challenge which was defining the content and unifying criteria and standardizing the indicators. We were looking at the MFI's uh, uh, databases, what they already had, and now we go to the arrow number two. <laughs> and that step was building on the infrastructure they already had. Okay, not, not, not asking them to produce any new uh, information and processes, etc., but looking at what they already had and, and extracting knowledge from there. So we, we're, we're taking a thorough look at their, at their databases and, and guaranteeing always uh, the quality data. So in this report, obviously, to, to, to appear in that, uh, that report, the process, the, all, the, all the tests and the quality data processes um, are very, um, um, very tough, let's say. Uh, and then the third arrow, which is where we already, or we, we, when, where we are starting now, and this is our challenge, is, that it int is to integrate this into management. With, we are now doing this by a regular reporting, not only producing this annual report, but also on a quarterly basis. For each MFI, we get their uh, information on all their client, uh, on all the, their clients, and we produce in Madrid um, a, a social performance quarterly report for each MFI, and we share it with them, and they revise it with their with their steering committees and their board of directors. And we're trying to include this as a part of the governance. And so this is why, why we think this is very important and very strategic area, okay? To be uh, a mission control unit and also to improve our impact. So where do we stand and where do we go? We are here in the first part of the slide. We are capturing, sharing, and creating knowledge on social performance. How, as I said before, continuously working on data quality and availability using this simple and pragmatic approach that you, that you just saw to apply outcome-focused social performance measurement, presenting these reports on a quarterly basis to each MFI, steering committee, and board of directors, and also working with other areas to test for hypotheses, for example, with product development or with risk management or with human resources. Um, and this is where we are now. And this, uh, this sketch here shows us how the MFIs share with us the client information on a, on a quarterly basis. And then the foundation, we go back to the, to the MFIs, feeding them back with our reports and management uh, directions. Uh, but where do we want to go? We want to transform that knowledge into action. This is the next step we want to go. Hmm? This is a challenge. We are now starting to think about setting, so setting incentives based on social performance indicators for our network. And this is a very important way to transform this knowledge into action. And ultimately, we want to improve these products and services based on social performance knowledge. We want to use this knowledge and transform this knowledge into an effective business strategy. So that's why we think this is an important part of the strategy of the foundation. 
But there's still a way to go, no? We need to go a step further in understanding our client's development and adapt to their needs. Because in the end, they are the lead characters of our project. And that's what really matters to us. Their progress, their development over time. And just to finish with a quote here by Deborah Winchell, uh, big impact needs big data and also big action. So that's what we think. And we want to combine this data and transform that knowledge into action and finally get big actions. So thank you very much uh, for being here. This is it. And now I open the floor for some Q&As. Okay, thank you. <laughs>